In the occult and age, New Age movement, there are angels they refer to as ascended masters, the hierarchy, the spirit guides. See, most believers who say they're believers get into their, the social life of their church. They have a good time. They clap their hands when they're singing, happy clappy. They speak to each other in the middle of the service and uh, talk about natural things. Then the service continues. Everything's nice and rosy and cosy. But that's not the world. That's inside the doors of a church building. They have to go out into the world and face what the world really is. And if they don't face it, they're living in a dream and following what the world is doing. We can't follow what the world is doing. We need to understand that Satan has a program whereby he can control the world. It's the occult. Every heathen religion is involved in the occult. We have spent years in Indonesia, amongst the Chinese, in India, and even in other countries, briefly, Thailand, and we have seen the occult in operation all the time. The people come to us and ask for prayer because of the power of the occult that somebody is using against them. One pastor had a wife who was crippled, a leading pastor in the Assemblies of God. He came from the Assemblies of God, but he founded a free church, a large church, he and his brother. And he said to me, do you think it's demonic? Because he held meetings once a week to cast the demons out of the heathen who were demon-possessed in the temple and came to him for deliverance and then became Christians. Well, I was a bit simple. I said, no, I don't think so. If he asked me today, I'd say definitely. It was true. The power of the occult is most strong. And it goes back to Nimrod. I have been saying this in my preaching for a long time. What occurs now goes back to Nimrod of Babylon. And Nimrod was a descendant of a giant. He was a giant. One of those who, who descended from the fallen angels and the women, the women of earth. And Nimrod didn't come through the, the flood, but his relatives did in some form, maybe Ham. But Ham came through the flood because he was a son of Noah by a heathen wife, I might say. And the story in, I think it's the Book of Jubilees, is that Ham went to Noah and he showed him a piece of rock on which was what we would call the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah, that is followed by millions of people today, particularly Judaism. They followed the Kabbalah. Ham followed the Kabbalah. Nimrod followed the Kabbalah in whatever form he had. And they were connected with the occult. The very fact that Nimrod lived in Babylon, tells us a story. Babylon is the source from which these occultic figures have come into the world. Now this is something I have taken from somebody else's writings and I tell you what I think is true in relation to the scriptures. Well, there's no doubt about it that the wars of the Nephilim kings in relation to the wars that Abraham was in had an occult secret linked to the Nephilim. We didn't major on that when we did that series, but it's there. Now this is part of masonry. And I am told that the Baptist churches of USA are full of masons. This is what Albert Pike, one of their philosophers said in relation to the mystery schools and the New Age movement. 
that there was a special knowledge contained in the pages of the Holy Bible. Therein is the secret fire, of which all the hermetic philosophers speak, the universal seed, the figure of Hermes, and so forth. And he actually mentions Daniel 2, 40. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. In Daniel 2, 43, the Nephilim sons of God, watches of Genesis 6. This is a Christian now saying this. There's something about God's creative power of life in the womb that is said by David. My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, yet being imperfect. And in your book, all my members were written, which in continuous were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139, 15. King David describes God seeing his body, his substance, before it was ever formed. And the book of the Lord in heaven showed body parts of David, written and fashioned before they were ever made. There are books in heaven. This is how DNA functions as the blueprint of a person's body. And this is what Satan sought to corrupt after God proclaimed a human child would one day conquer him. And that's through the bloodlines of the Nephilim, which I'm not touching on now. Now there's something else this writer says, Christian writer. In the occult and age, New Age movement, there are angels they refer to as ascended masters, the hierarchy, the spirit guides. And he says, this is the, the very era that those in the occult look forward to and seek to bring into being. The most magic rituals are just means of attempting to communicate with the heavenly spirit, spiritual realm. We need to be aware of this. There was somebody who spent several years in Peru, in the Amazon forest, who went into trances because he had a plant-based hallucinogen that's popular of late, and not only saw serpents, but drew figures of intertwined serpents in the looked identical to the shape of DNA. And he shows an example from ancient Sumeria, 2200 BC. You see, Satan said to Eve that if she disobeyed God, she would be as a God and never die. He was a serpent because he said, God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open. This is a kind of a symbol of the snakes in Hermeticism from Egypt, the intertwined serpents, from where we get the name Yahweh, Jehovah, as I've often pointed out. We should never use the name Yahweh, Jehovah, Jah. The name of our God is the I am that I am, the Lord. The Aboriginals in Australia have a spiral ladder, a stairway, or braided, braided ropes in, in Australia and other places, and it's a symbol. What do you think it's a symbol of? What Satan has put in their minds to try and get the attention of Jesus Christ, who said about himself that Jacob saw the ladder reaching up into heaven and angels ascending and descending. I want to tell you that we are under the occult today. Paul mentioned it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. He said, those who came from Jerusalem who followed Judaism. Not only did they follow the Judaism of Moses, they followed the Judaism of Babylon. James, John, Peter. Paul rebuked Peter to his face. And in Galatians 3, verse 1, Paul said to the church in Galatia, who has cast the evil eye on you? Who has bewitched you that you should listen to Peter, James and John from Jerusalem? Peter has sneaked in 
to try and pervert the gospel. That's what it amounted to. And if we do a study of Galatians, we will find that out. So even there, the Ockhart ruled from the Judaism of Jerusalem in that church. It's the same today. It rules in our churches. Once it gets into the churches, demons control. Demons control the doctrines. Demons control their beliefs in, Je in Jesus Christ by being changed into following something else other than Jesus Christ. It's going on all over the world. In every country where there are Christians, Protestants, Charismatics, Pentecostals, that brethren control. Yes, Jesus has a burden for his people. I would like to read from the Acts of St. Paul and Thecla, chapter 1. Paul went into the house of Anesiphorus. He's mentioned in one of the epistles of Paul. And there was great joy among the family on that account. So what did they do? Had a good old yarn? No. And they employed themselves in prayer, breaking of bread, which was eating, and hearing Paul preach the word of God concerning temperance and resurrection in the following manner. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are they who keep their flesh undefiled or pure, for they shall be the temple of God. Blessed are the temperate or chaste, for God will reveal himself to them. Blessed are they who abandon their worldly enjoyments, for they shall be accepted of God. Blessed are they who have wives, as though they had them not, for they shall be made angels of God. Blessed are they who tremble at the word of God, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they who pursue the wisdom or doctrine of Jesus Christ, for they shall be called the sons of the Most High. Blessed are they who for the love of Christ abandon the glories of the world, for they shall judge angels and be placed in the right hand of Christ and shall not suffer the bitterness of the last judgment. Blessed are the bodies and souls of virgins, for they are acceptable to God and shall not lose the reward of their virginity, for the word of their heavenly Father shall prove effectual to their salvation in the day of his Son, and they shall enjoy rest for evermore. With preaching like that, you can understand, in a measure, why the evil fathers of the church removed such books from the Bible as the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Now we say this, will you be ready when the bridegroom comes? Will you be ready when the bridegroom comes? Be it morning, noon or night. Will your lamps be trimmed and bright? Will you be ready when the bridegroom comes? That applies to all of us. Lamps trimmed and bright meant that the virgins who were, who were unable to go into the wedding feast had oil in their lamp. Oil in the scriptures is a type of the Holy Spirit. And all you can say from Matthew 25 is Jesus is talking about having lamps full of the Holy Spirit of oil. He's talking about people being full of the Holy Spirit. You cannot take that out of the parable. Oil typifies the Holy Spirit. Everybody who's any kind of a Bible scholar says that. So what does it say? You have to be full of the Holy Spirit. That eliminates most of the church. And what about the Pentecostals who know it, but are not filled with the Holy Spirit always? What about us? Are our lamps trimmed and burning all the time? Are we following the purity of Christ? It's really very warning to us as believers, because Jesus had a burden, and he told that parable in Matthew 25. He wants us to be ready. Will we be ready? We need to be ready with oil in our lamps. Shall we pray? Lord, among us all, 
May there be many who will have oil in our lamps, who will be following the purity of Christ, who will not be worldly, who will be loving the things of heaven more than the things of this earth, who will not be concerned with the things of this earth to such an exclusion of heavenly things that it is almost as if we don't know the Lord. Have mercy on us, Lord. Oh, dear Jesus, we ask for your grace. We ask for your mercy that we might be ready when the bridegroom comes, that we might have our lamps trimmed and burning full of the oil of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you with his mercy and me.